Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be here to share our experience about um, building visual similarity project for recommendations for shopping recommendations at Vicom. So this is the agenda for today's talk. I will start a brief introduction about um, Vicom and about uh, the visual similarity. Then I will talk more about the implementation, how we extract image embeddings from uh, images, and how we do similarity search. So after that, I will wrap up the talk. So in this talk, um, I would like to share this, our, our, our knowledge that we learned in the process of building this project. Um, so I would like to show you that even for um, a mid-scale company, it's easy to uh, utilize the image data and to um, build something similar to this, like visual similarity or visual search. So I hope after this talk, you can get some inspiration to like build a, some, some image-based product on your own data. So uh, a brief introduction about myself. My name is Chi Chao Zhong. Uh, I'm start, so I'm a data scientist at Vicomp. And before that, I finished my PhD in the Netherlands. So these are the topics that I am interested in or have, partic have participated at Vicomp. Virus similarity is one of the projects. Also, I would like to introduce about um, Vicomp. So Vicomp is an online shopping company in the Netherlands. It's mainly focused on the Dutch market. So here are some facts about the company. Uh, so we have more than 400,000 products online, and we have about um, half a million daily visitors. Last year, we have accomplished more than 6 million sales, and we have sent out more than 11 packages last year. Also, one very interesting fact about Vacom is that it has a history of more than 67 years. So. It was actually founded back in 1952. And so it has been a catalog shopping company for many years. Then uh, in, 2000, sorry, in 1995, it launched its first step online. Then in 2010, it turned completely online. And now we are really focused on offering a great shopping experience to our customers. And how can we offer a great shopping experience to our customers? Of course, data science uh, is an important part of it. So our, our team, the data science team at Vacomp, try to uh, offer a great shopping experience to the customers by developing various uh, data science project, machine learning project. And we use the um, Databricks platform a lot to connect with the system and to uh, develop the project, train the models, serve the data, etc. So visual similarity is one of these projects. Um, what is visual similarity and why it is important? So as for shopping company, uh, as for shopping, visuals are quite important to the customers, right? So I guess nobody have ever seen like online shopping website that don't have images. So also at Vacom, we have lots of visuals for the customers. We have our own studio to take product image or model image um, for, the, for the product and also since fashion is the largest category of our company, um, visuals become even more important for our company. So we started looking for opportunities to utilize this visual data. And then we noticed that actually visual similarity is quite important because um, when people are shopping, they tend to look at look alike products. Like in this example of the recommender, is generated based on customer's clicks. So it shows that actually when customers are shopping the dress uh, of this dress, they're also comparing similar dresses. Um, sorry about this. So um, the visual similarity project is to retrieve visually similar look alike products purely based on, on images instead of building based on clicks. So um, by developing such a project, it's not only um, to improve the shopping experience, but also it contribute um, to Vacom's revenue and contribute to the uh, money that Vacom can make. So we have already implemented some products on the visual similarity project. This is one example. 
that we um, show the substitute for out of stock items. So this is a function that the customer can use on our app or on web to complete a look as the model image shows. So sometimes some items may be out of look, but it would be not nice to like show in complete um, product list. And we see that by, by offering substitute, we actually achieve a better click-through rate. Another example is to improve the product overview page. We can group similar products together so that customers can compare the products easily. Another use case is to uh, improve the recommendation, like to, uh, to address the cold start problem. When we don't have enough data, we don't have enough click data, when we have newly onboarded data, we can just show similar products to the customers so that you know, it's just a nice recommender. Also, there are other applications like um, for products that are left in their wish list, we can also send visually similar items by email so that people the customers can also maybe trigger um, to buy the alternatives. Okay, so uh, how can we do a visual similarity? Search for visually similar items. So this is actually quite similar to visual search. Uh, it can be broken down into two steps. The first step is to extract the image embeddings, and the second step is to search for um, similar embeddings. So what is image embeddings? So image embeddings is simply a low dimensional vector uh, representation of image. So um, how many of you have worked with image data before? Well, so quite a lot. <laughs> so I think this is quite easy for you to understand. So we have image embeddings and why we need that because actually an image have lots of redundant information like the background is black, but we need so many uh, pixels to represent this information. Uh, well, we don't need that much information. Um, so we can like extract the information and store that in a vector representation. And nowadays the most popular approach to extract embeddings is to use the convolutional neural network, right? So it's very popular approach nowadays for image data. We use it for image classification, object detection, etc. And it's many so it has many, many uh, layers. And one of the key components is the convolutional layer, which, can, uh, which we apply on different positions of the image and extract the feature maps. And another important layer is the fully connected layer. So fully connected layer map the feature map to the embeddings. And from embeddings, you can uh, apply like the softmax layer to do the prediction. So as I mentioned before, at Vacom we took images for our, for the older products. So we actually have really uh, nice, nicely cropped product images. We have our own image data set. And so at the beginning we thought, okay, we can just use the model that has been trained on like the image net data set, which are just natural images like cat and dogs. But can we use our own data set to improve the model performance? Yes, we can. And so we took the transfer learning approach so that we don't have to train from scratch. Because if you want to train from scratch, you might need a large amount of data set. So in our project, we take the VGG 16, 16 models that is trained on the image net data set and we uh, adopt, we change the fully connected layers, and one purpose is to get uh, a reduced size of the embeddings, and we also train the f only the fully connected layers on our own data set. And how can we train uh, these layers? So there are many, many approaches, and the approach that we adopt, which is also uh, quite popular nowadays, is the triplet loss approach. And um, what, what that means is that um, you have, you fit your model with three images. They are, they are like a triplet. One is the anchor image, and the other one is a positive image. So these two should be similar. And you should also fit with a negative image, which is not similar to the other two. And the triplet loss is simply defined um, by the 
Euclidean distance between the embeddings of the positive and the anchor minus the Euclidean distance between the anchor and the negative. So here, the Euclidean distance actually gives you the similarity. So the smaller the Euclidean distance is, the more similar the, the, the embeddings are. Well, so triplet loss is quite easy to interpret. If you minimize, you train your model, and your model try to minimize the triplet loss, what you will do, it will bring together the embeddings of the positive and anchor image and increase the gap between negative and the anchor embeddings. And this parameter of alpha here is something that you can tune to, um, to control the margin between um, the positive distance and the negative distance. Okay, so uh, that's, that's the triplet loss. Once you have defined the loss, um, we can use the triplet loss on the so-called CMS network uh, structure, which is also quite often used in viral search, in viral similarity, or for uh, face recognition to train the similarity network. So it's nothing but just um, identical convolutional neural networks that you can fit these three images to these identical convolutional networks and get in balance, and when you minimize the triplet loss, um, you can backpropagate the gradients to update the weights. So uh, once, so I have talked about the methodology. Now it's about how we prepare the data and train the model. So we actually first manually take similar product images into the same group. Um, this is how we just we just sample two images from the same group as the anchor and positive, and one from the any other group as the negative image. So it's just a very naive way of sampling. And then from thousands of images, we can sample tens of thousands of triplets. That's how the data we prepared. OK, let's see. Uh, so at, at the beginning, I say we train the model because we want that the model can perform better on our own data set. So this is how it performed now after the training. So actually, we see some improvements of the precision. So it actually improved from about 76% to 80%. And also, uh, the image embedding size is smaller, remember that in this case. But is this good enough? So it's quite promising, but it's, I, I, to be honest, I'm not that excited about this result because it's not even close to 90%. But if we want to um, move a step forward, mainly by fitting more data or to fine tune the hyperparameters, we hit the problem of that. Well, training CMS network is actually quite expensive. And this is the number we get. We got actually, we, we spent 29 hours to try and train on, on one single GPU. So um, then we want to migrate from a single node training to distributed training. But then um, to migrate from single machine to distributed training, it might be quite. It might not. It might not be that easy because you might not just need to set up your own cluster. You might need to, you know, uh, modify your code to do distributed training. Uh, luckily, and there is this uh, framework that is developed by Uber, which is called Horovolt. So we utilize this framework to do distributed training. So we use it mainly for two reasons. One is that it gives you a quite good scaling efficiency. It's supposed to ha have some, such a good scaling efficiency, um, powered by the algorithm behind it, which is called Ori or ring reduce algorithm. And the other feature of this framework is that it, it requires minimal code modification. And this is designed to, to by, the, by the developers of this framework. Well, um, if you have the whole vote, you might still need to set up your own clusters. You might need to I implement your whole vote on your own clusters. Um, but since we use the Databricks platform, this makes things much easier because on Databricks platform, there is this Horovolt runner API, which you can use just to simply uh, run the Horovolt on Databricks. So in the next page, I'm going to show you some code example about how we migrate from single machine to distributed training. 
Um, well, that's the single machine code. First lesson we learned is that on Databricks, it's better to put your data for deep learning on this fuse mount, uh, dbfs backslash ml, which is optimized for uh, deep, deep learning, for the, for the input and output for deep learning. And then next line, we, uh, so this is a, a customized function to sample the data and read the data and sample the triplet lost, sorry, the triplet index. And we also, based on the Keras API, we build the image data generator for triplet loss. Then, well, you know, if you know about Keras, this is just some standard way to feed the data to the model. Well, so what this image data generator can do is that each time you will fit all these three images to the to the model. Then the Simus network, sorry, the Simus model is just defined um, afterwards. And you define your optimizer, send the weight, and compile it and train it. So um, what's really customized here is the image data generator. Well, if you want to migrate from single machine to um, distributed training on Horovod Runner, um, these are the extra codes you need to do. So what Horovod Runner do is that it pickle all the Horovod code in this function, train HVD. And it's going to distribute the function um, on all the process and do the training and, and synchronizing the, uh, the weights. So these are some uh, extra codes you need. First, you need to initialize the Horovod instance. And then after that, you take some standard codes to pin your GPUs. So these are really standard codes. I just neglect them. And then the second, st second step is, again, to load the data. But one lesson we learned here is that don't forget to evenly distribute your data across all the process. Otherwise, um, the, the training won't be able to be synchronized. So afterwards, the image data generator code is the same as on single machine. And also the model is the same as on single machine. Um, optimizer is similar, but you need one extra line of code to distribute the optimizer. Then op compiling is the same. Uh, after that, you have some configurations to configure your learning rate or your checkpoints, etc. But you, you can check that on documentations. Um, so then you feed the generator. So like, yeah, about after seven steps, you can migrate from single machine to distributed training. Well, and what can that bring us? Well, it can bring us really good scale up, actually. So um, we can scale up by 10 times by increasing the size to 32 GPUs. So this is the um, throughput performance. However, um, this is a, still a little bit lower than I expected. So I expect the ideal situation would be like 32 GPUs. And on the horrible documentation, you can see that um, for some good deep learning task, um, the scale up can be like about 90% of scale up. But in our case, we didn't reach that far. So this is like the difference between the ideal, the, the expected scale up and the real scale up. Um, so yeah, um, to be honest, I, I didn't know, I don't know why. Um, so we are still um, in the process of investigating this. So it could be that. Simon's network is not optimal for distributed training, or it could, be, could be that we hit some I and O issues for Harvard Runner. So if any of you have any experience about um, distributed training on Harvard Runner, um, you're very welcome to like give some tips after this talk. Um, so that's, that's about the training the neural network for distributed training. So we have trained a model on single node on our own data set, um, which is currently on production. And we have explored migrating from a single machine to distributed training. Then after that, the second step is to search for similar embeddings once you get the embeddings. Well, at first, we just tried out just 
just do brute force, right? We have the embeddings. Why not just just uh, ca calculate the Euclidean distance and sort the Euclidean distance and get the one with the minimum Euclidean distance? But it turns out that even for our scale of data, it's too slow and too expensive. So um, then we look for like solutions, w the available solutions. We find that just right in Spark, there's a nice implementation for uh, approximate similarity search based on locality, locality sensitivity, sorry, sensitive hashing. So what that means, it means that um, it, it has two steps. The first step is to hash similar embeddings into buckets. So you don't have that many candidates to compute a Euclidean distance once you have hashed the embeddings into buckets. And the second step is that you only take the embeddings in the same bucket and compute the Euclidean distance and do the sort and so on. So, has anyone worked with uh, used this LSH before? Cool. Uh, so this is a quite standard way to do approximate similarity search. I'm gonna briefly explain what it is. So it's nothing but just a hashing function to hash dimensional, high dimensional vectors um, with a small distance into buckets and um, with a high probability. So as in this example, you can see that we hash these four vectors into buckets and we hope, in, we hope that using the SSH, we can hash the green and the blue one into the set bucket and the other two into the other buckets. Since we are using the Euclidean distance for similarity, uh, this is the formula of the hashing function we use in Spark. The so V is just a random univector, and R is the bucket length. So R is a parameter that you can choose, you can tune in Spark. So if you choose a large um, bucket length, you will end up with more candidates in the same bucket. What that means? That means you might have a higher accuracy also, you will have a worse query performance. Also, here are some examples of these hashing functions. A v is the random univector, and R is the uh, Euclidean distance, and x1 and x2 are hashed into bucket 1, x3 are hashed into bucket 2. In Spark, um, this function is implement it in a way that you can have multiple hashing functions to hash uh, your vectors into multiple tables, which can help you to improve the accuracy, but yeah, the same, uh, again, you get uh, worse query performance if you have many, many hash tables. So um, these two parameters are what we have to deal with when we use this LSH in Spark. So in our team, how we deal with these two parameters, we, we just, you know, just try it out. We just run the experiments with different parameters on our own data set, given the resource we can afford, given the time we can afford, and we choose the best parameters for our own use case. Okay, so uh, that's the second step about the approximate similarity search. So I have talked about extracting image embeddings um, by training your own model. Well, actually, yeah, if you, if you, yeah, you can just use the uh, normal image, sorry, the, the just a model trainer image net to extract image embeddings. You don't even need to train your model sometimes. Well, so here, uh, and I also talk about doing the approximate similarity search. So here is how we implement these two steps in our, on our pipeline. So um, we deploy the model, the image embedding extraction model on S3, sorry, on Databricks. And we read the data from S3, extract the embeddings, and write the embeddings back to S3. Well, again, on Databricks, we do the similarity search using Spark. And also, we read some product information like category or brands of this product to help this similarity search. 
After that, we write the similar data back to to Redis cl Redis cluster, which you know it's an in-memory uh, storage, uh, which is really efficient. After that, the app or web service can just read from the Redis cluster. So here are some examples about the result. Uh, here is a um, product. Um, it's a it's a it's a code with green pat grid patterns. So we send this as query and see what it, the Redis returns. So it actually returns to the top ones are also code with uh, similar grid patterns. And what's interesting is that if you look at the bottom ones, the 8 to 9 to 10, well, they either don't have barcodes or they have different, very different color or they don't even have grid patterns. And here are some examples about boot. So we uh, send a query of the login boot with laces to our, our data, and then we got all the boots also having um, laces. And the Chelsea boots, which don't have laces, we also got um, Chelsea boots back. Yeah, so um, that's the result. So in summary, we I have um, shown you how we implement the virus similarity project at Vcomp to improve the shopping experience for the customers. Um, so we use the convolutional neural network to extract image embeddings. As I said um, previously, you can just use the model that is pre-trained um, image net, you will already get some embeddings, nice embeddings. But here we want to adopt the model to our own data set. So we train the model on our own data set and we improve the accuracy. Also we reduce the embedding size. Um, in order to scale up this training, we also explored using Horovolt on Databricks to, distribu to do distributed training. So um, after you get embeddings, what you need to do to retrieve visually similar items is to do approximate similarity search. Well, we use the locality sensitivity hashing implemented on Spark to do the uh, approximate similarity search. Well, so in the future, there are still lots of work that we can do. Uh, one thing is that we would like to collect more data based on like customers' clicks on those uh, implementations to get a higher accuracy. And another approach we can take to get a better performance is to um, extract binary embeddings instead of continuous value embeddings. And this will really help to speed up the search process. Also, uh, in this talk, it's about visual similarity. But once you have all these image features, you can also fit that to your recommenders to do other pro to do other, um, I don't know, to develop other products. Like in our case, we also tried out using the image features to find combinations of button and top and to generate recommendations to the customers. Yeah, um, so that's it for today. Any question? Hi, uh, thanks for the interesting talk. It's a very nice work. I have a doubt about uh, how do you generate the groups? So you mentioned that you can generate various triplets uh, by sampling from these groups, but you still have the problems to generate the groups. I mean, you have to define what is similar to what, and uh, so did you, how did you do it? Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so the question is about how we generate the initial data for training the model, right? Uh, so actually, we just do that by manual work. <laughs> yeah, so we write a simple application um, by just um, randomly select the items from our, our product groups, and then we pick which are like similar 
um, just we just do that as a first step to generate the data. But in the future, since we now have already implement, implemented the product, we might be able to collect more data from the customers. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a question about the substitutes you mentioned in the beginning. And I wonder, how did you identify the two items are substitutes by calculating the similarity between two products? Perhaps maybe these two products, they have higher similarity in the image, but they are not substitutes. They are maybe one is the winter clothes or one is the summer clothes. But from the image or pixels, their data are quite similar. So how do you identify their substitutes? That's the yeah. question. Yeah, thank you for the question. So the question is about if we only have um, this similarity search, how can we identify the substitutes? So uh, in impl implementation, we also add some other metadata, like um, just the categories of the products. For example, if you want to search I mean, you, you, you get the similar items, but then you also apply the filter of if these two items are in the same group, are they both dresses, or one is shirt, one another one is dress. So we apply this kind of filter to make sure that they are just separate substitutes. Yeah. So the, the so uh, in our company we also have the metadata of like the categories of the products. Um, they so this product are usually they just belong to the same group of data. Sorry, the same group of items like like shoes, like boots are in one category, but Chelsea boots and and logging boots they are they are in also in the same category. Yeah, that, that's like about the range of the narrow. Hi. Uh, what kind of percentage of images from your production you analyzed at the beginning manually? Because I understand you did it manually. How many pictures did you need to train the model? And after, how many pictures you can associate with? So um, we actually, the, the, the data size is about 3,000, 3,500. So it's not that much. Um, yeah, but it, overall we have about um, about four hundred thousand images, four hundred thousand products. So this is only about one percent of all the images. Okay, and did you use previous orders of users to say okay they associate this kind of product, or did um, you match the this algorithm with the previous order of the the, cl the clients? Not yet, not yet. So this is what we would like to do. So um, the thing is that if you use these like customers' data to train the model, you might get lots of noise. Like people, they might be buying two things together, not because they are similar, but because you know they just they, they just have a, like the the price is good, some other information. So our approach is that we first train an initial model. And then uh, after we collect more data, we can also apply the similarity search um, to this customer's data set to get rid of this noise. OK, thanks. Thank you. Hi, I wanted to ask, uh, did you also think about combining the similarity search, not just the visual information, but maybe also some structured data about the product, or maybe even the price? And I guess even for clothing, there could be some structured features, uh, like uh, what is the mat material and things like that. So is that something you are thinking about? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so yes, we, there are lots of structured data like the category, which I has mentioned in the previous uh, question. And there are also some other structured data, like cluster of brands. So you can you know, narrow down your recommendations even, even closer by recognizing um, similar brands based on customers' clicks 
And by applying those kind of information, you can get even better data. But it really depends on the use case. So this one is like developed as a for general use case where you can use across all different products. But for yeah, if you would like to use other structured data, it really depends on use case. Yeah. Um, is there any reason why you choose the VGG19 model? Did you try other architectures, or uh, was it something that worked in particular for your uh, type of images? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So the question is that why we choose this VGG um, model instead of other? There are lots of other more advanced models like ResNet or other models, right? Um, uh, so the, the answer is that we just want to try something that has been proven to be um, successful, let's say proven to be stable. So VGG has, is used in many places for uh, feature extraction because it has like very ordered structure where you can extract features. So the reason why we started with VGG is that maybe we think maybe we can also use these feature maps to do, this, to do something else. Um, but then, you know, uh, we get good result with VGG, then we didn't try out other models. So you're right, if there is, we have more time, um, definitely we should try other models like the ResNet model. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, hello. Yes, this is the question uh, about uh, Similarities computation uh, to which query you mentioned that you use the the last product or the basically one product, but did you try a more complex representation as a as a user vector? Let's say that uses a combination of uh, other products, and uh, do you do any experiments with uh, that area? Uh, I'm sorry. Could you please refresh the question a bit more? So you mentioned that uh, you used. Uh, as a query, the product, single mm. product. Yeah. Did you experiment with uh, other uh, queries uh, being, for instance, a combination of uh, products uh, for product vectors or more learned representations of users? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, no, actually. <laughs> so with the query, we only use the uh, embeddings from the product image. Um, yeah, I think there are also lots of work which combine the vector of the image with other vectors, like the attribute of products, like the, the price range, or um, I don't know, the style, which you can also generate embeddings and combine that to do the search. Um, yeah, that would be really nice to combine all the product features. And it's also like one of the, I think one of the future work of our work. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Uh, thanks, Jisho, for a wonderful talk. Uh, please don't forget to rate the session after uh, after the talk. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.